I'm Teresa Caraggio, and this is Third Paradigm. My topic today is shelter from the storm, and I'm going to tell a search and rescue saga with a moral. Last Friday, my daughter Veronica drove down to visit, deliberating because there were torrential cloudbursts and had been two days of solid rain. But she decided to risk it, and when she showed up, she confessed that she was worried that she hadn't heard from her husband James. He'd gone backpacking in Big Sur by himself three days prior, and was supposed to be back that day and would contact her as soon as he got back in service. She hadn't heard from him. Now, James is a mountain guy and is very resilient and quite confident, known to take some serious risks. So this didn't make her feel any better. And Veronica is a bereavement counselor. So the stories that she hears are always the ones where worst has come to worst. It is a bad combination. Veronica called his dad's house to see if he had arrived and maybe something had happened with his phone. She didn't want to worry him, especially since James's mom had died a year prior, two weeks after their wedding. But he hadn't heard from them, and after we went through all the possible scenarios, focusing on the non-fatal ones, we finally tried to go to sleep. Early in the morning, Veronica crawled into my bed, not wanting to be alone with her worry. And we listened to the rain falling and were cheered when it did seem to be clearing for a bit. When they opened, she called the park service and only got automated messages everywhere she called. She found an emergency number for them and got through there and then ended up with a woman who seemed annoyed like she had interrupted her nail filing and told her curtly, after she asked all the information twice, that she would get a call back. So I thought that she should wait for a while. And Veronica said, I know how these things go. You really have to be your own advocate. And so she decided to call 911. 911 had a very competent person who gave her several different phone numbers to check. And one of those was an inside number for the park service, which got another excellent woman who gave her a bunch of good information. And as she was on the phone with her, she said, well, wait a minute. And a report came in that there had been a mudslide on the trail that James was walking. She also said there were no reported injuries or deaths. There was a search and rescue in process, but no names were known. Hallelujah. So James's dad was called and told the good news that there was no guarantees, but a plausible explanation for why there could be delay. And then his brothers headed down that way with blankets and dry clothes and the hope that they would not also, being mountain men with the same confidence, barge their way into the forest and create more lost people. So then more waiting ensued. And I'm skipping over a lot of the waiting part. After a while, she called back the very competent woman at the park service because she didn't know whether her mind was playing tricks on her. And maybe she only heard that it was the trail and it was wishful thinking, but the mudslide was really somewhere else. The woman confirmed that that was the trail and that there was a party of five that was on the other side, which she didn't know if that included James. And then she said, oh, there's new information that they have for you. Let me transfer you. And she transferred her to a woman who turned out to be the nail filer again, even more annoyed that Veronica was calling back again and told her, we will call you when we have a chance. Have a nice day. She actually said that. Have a nice day. Eventually, the sheriff deputy did call and was surprised to learn that James was a solo hiker, a fact he repeated more than made Veronica comfortable. 
and might not be in that party of five. Now, we were hoping at this point they were all bonded for life because for my fellow conspiracy buffs, James looks a lot like that guy in the WEF, you will own nothing and be happy. He has that really likable face of someone who you just want to take home and make tea for in your tiny temporary space. Finally, we got word that he was in that group. More waiting ensued, but an hour or so later, his brother sent a photo of a very sheepish James peeking out of a search and rescue shuttle. Then he was fed, he was given dry clothes, he got a shower, and he was able to be back to himself with some very sore feet. Later, after they'd talked, I found out his side of the story. The other party were four young Christians in their 20s, two girls, two guys, including a brother and sister. They were the first to discover when they tried to leave Friday morning the 20-foot mudslide on the path. The girls had never hiked before, and one of them had a very paranoid dad who tried to talk her out of it, and fortunately also had a satellite phone, one that was at 11% but went down to 4% during the time that they were trying to use it to contact 911. It would only work when the satellite was directly overhead, but that was enough for them to be able to make contact. And by that time, James had left, true to form, thinking that he knew a shortcut where he'd be able to get back. So he went down to this place that he thought, I can cross this river, which at this point was rollicking, if not raging. And there was a rope across it. So he put on his board shorts that would dry quickly and a rain poncho, and he tried to get across it. And the rope just kept pulling and pulling and pulling and stretching. And finally, half of his backpack was submerged with all of his clothes in it. And he knew he wasn't going to make it. So he went back and went back to the path and to the group. A rescue attempt was made on Friday, where two guys tried to throw a rope across. But after a half hour, it was just too far and it was starting to get dark. So they said that they would have to be back in the morning. James was there with a sodden sleeping bag and a tent that was little more than mosquito netting. The four Christians, in the middle of a fresh deluge, set up their tent, which then got wet inside and out, and between them, they had one dryish sleeping bag. But they invited James into their temporary little slick space, and they huddled with him, and all five of them huddled for warmth. They were singing gospel songs and talking about Jesus and praying, and James was right there in the middle of their little nest where the one who was studying to be a nurse wouldn't let anybody sleep because of hypothermia. And besides that, if you laid down, you were in the puddles of water. So they all sat together and tried to be happy. (laughs) Mid-morning, a crew of 10 arrived. And I saw a video of this, but I still don't know exactly how it was possible. There was one person who they called this hero woman who ferried each one of them across on her back, mountain climbing her way over, including taking separate trips to bring their packs over. And James, still true to form, was packing out other people's trash, making sure to leave the forest pristine, even if it killed him. That evening, after everything had settled down, James came in right after Veronica had picked a card from my Crow Tarot deck. And I read it, and it was clearly for James, the Five of Pentacles. 
The five of pentacles shows two groups of crows. One is warm and comfortable, roosting in a tree. The second group struggles against a headwind in the frozen ground, unable to see that relief is almost in sight. The ones on the ground may have lost everything, but take comfort that they still have each other. Even when all appears lost, there are still opportunities. Feed your spirit by focusing less on materialism and more on relationships. On his own, James had lost civilization, communication, shelter, security. He had no shirt, no shoes, no service. He had nowhere to sit to be warm and dry except in a puddle. He had lost everything as much as I could imagine. And the four Christian crows welcomed him into their huddled midst. They shared whatever they had, a leaky tent and a semi-dry sleeping bag. They kept prodding him awake and singing gospel songs and keeping his spirits up and keeping the faith, the faith that manifested as a hero woman and a relentless dad and a methodical wife who would not take have a nice day as an answer. And to follow this up, here's the four agreements which I made on the week of their wedding. And this is a question for my youngest daughter. What's the best that can happen? Thank you for watching.